Hi, this is Dave and welcome to To The Table, a series of videos where I review and discuss various board and card games, looking at them from a family perspective. And today is a special episode in which I'm going to be going over my top games from 2014. Now let me start off by saying that 2014 was a great year for uh, board games in the industry in terms of its growth, in terms of people playing, and also the quality of games that came out. And there were a lot of games that were released this year. It's mind-blowing if you were to look at all of the games that uh, came out this year. So it's nice to see that uh, as a whole this hobby is expanding and there's a lot more uh, stuff to uh, that is coming out for all of us to be able to play and enjoy. So anyways, I have uh, 15 games here that uh, I'm going to be talking about. Five of them are my honorable mentions and then I have a top 10. And I have some criteria that I used and compiling my list and there were three things and it's very simple number one it's a solid game with good mechanics and it has something that made it stand out above the other games whether it's something that was innovative or just a really really cool theme that made it stand out that uh, lent to an overall fun experience or was some kind of uh, mechanic that just was brought about that's kind of something new uh, so it kind of broke the mold and did something different and then second criteria is, uh, is the game something that uh, could be easily incorporated into, the, um, into the, like the family being able to enjoy as a hobby, whether it's playing with younger kids or older kids, or if you are a family who does not have children, or maybe there's older children that are out of the house, a way to kind of bring everybody together. Uh, specifically, if you don't have kids, it's something that you can share with your spouse and maybe uh, in, you know, share with some of your friends and bring them into the hobby as well. And then finally, the third thing is, uh, was there was some kind of really, really cool benefit that was offered by playing this game that just kind of made it worthwhile. Not only are you playing the game and enjoying it, but you're going to get something out of it as well. So that was the criteria for these games, and these are ones that I have played this year. So uh, let me get started here with my honorable mentions. And the first game that I want to talk about is Valley of the Kings by AEG, and this is a micro game, and this is a deck builder. Uh, and one of the reasons why I picked this one for honorable mention is that typically in a deck building game, uh, you are using your resources to acquire more powerful cards to place them into your hand to play them to uh, basically you're building an engine. Well, this kind of changes things because uh, what you need to do is uh, you're going to have to put these cards into a tomb. Um, because in Valley of the Kings, you're like an Egyptian pharaoh and you're trying to uh, gather up all these treasures that you want to have buried with you. And so what happens in this game is that the more powerful cards happen to be more valuable cards when you entomb them, which basically means you're taking them out of play. So this kind of changes uh, the whole thought process in a deck building game in which you're building up your engine, but then you they're... If the cards are in your deck, yes, they're powerful, but they're not worth any points. So you need to kind of you need to take them out of play in order to uh, in order for you to be successful with them. So that just stood out for me. And not only that, it's a really really solid game for uh, two to four players. Plays rather quickly, and especially being in like this micro game uh, family, this is a really really solid solid game. So Valley of the Kings. This one's by AEG. <clears throat> My next honorable mention is Green Deal by Karma Games, and I just recently did a review on this. And this game here is a solid, solid economic game in which you're uh, you're operating a business in the future, going over um, you're investing in like these sustainable projects, and you have different things that are going on uh, in the game, and you are you are playing uh, to to have an overall balanced portfolio because part of the mechanics of the game is that you are. Uh, going to be evaluated. You're going to be looked at as how well you are in the in the public eye's perception, how well you manage your money, how well you diversify your portfolio and where you are in terms of global presence, how much money you have in the bank. So really, really solid game. Uh, this one is like in the vein of Power Grid, but I think that this one, I, I like how this one plays more than, uh, than Power Grid, and it also doesn't take as much time. So if you're looking for a solid economic game, you might want to track down Green Deal. Uh, this one, though, you're going to have to order from overseas. So it's, this one's not readily available in the United States as of yet, but uh, I do know that the designer is looking for a publisher to have this game 
uh, in the United States. But uh, Green Deal, really solid economic game. All right, next up, we have Quilt Show, and this is a set collection game, and it's very much in the same heart as uh, Ticket to Ride, but this has some different things going on for it. Number one, the theme. Uh, this is something that you have uh, typically not seen in games, and this is like manufacturing quilts. So now you're taking a hobby and you're bringing it into another hobby with this particular game. And it also adds the element of time in here. So you are uh, gathering up your fabrics and you're manufacturing them into these quilting squares. But each time that you do that, it takes away so much time. And as you're going along with all the players, what happens is once a certain amount of time has passed, it's time for a quilt show. And so you're going to take the squares that you've uh, collected and you're going to... Uh, fabricate them into these these uh, quilting patterns and you're going to enter them in a f in the quilt show in an attempt to uh, gain uh, prize money and so there's little ribbons that come out and everything like that so uh, and so there, that's a really really cool thing you have this time mechanic and then you can compete and there's different patterns that you can do to create these quilts and one of the neat things is that uh, just because you have a bunch of these squares early on in the game you don't have to enter them in a contest right away you can kind of hold on to them. So this is a really, really solid game. Um, has beautiful artwork, and it's this is a lot of fun. If you're looking for a, a nice set collection game, uh, Quilt Show is one that I would recommend that you try. Uh, next up, we have Shadow Run Crossfire, and this is a uh, deck building game that uh, really. Uh, contributed a major change to the uh, deck building genre of games. Now deck building games in my opinion this year has seen the largest growth and the largest uh, number of different uh, changes and things that have really kind of helped this to evolve. And In Shadowrun Crossfire one of the neat things with this is that it brings about more of this role playing aspect and what happens is over the course of the game you're playing this and you're going to be uh, able to essentially level up. You're going to be able to acquire skills. And you have a player card in which you can put these little stickers on there. And so the stronger that you get, the, the more benefits that you're going to have as you play. And also, the neat thing is that the stronger you get, the game also increases in difficulty. So it's, you're not, even though right now there's only a few missions for this game, because it just came out this year, uh, the, the missions become more difficult the more that you play them. So really kind of a, a solid uh, a solid thing that's going to happen here it, with the Shadowrun Crossfire. Again, it's this is in the Shadowrun universe, which is very popular in the role-playing thing. And this is now bridging the gap here between role-playing games and, um, and actually like a deck-building board game. So Shadowrun Crossfire. And then my last honorable mention here is Black Fleet and this one was put out by the Space Cowboys and uh, the neat thing with this game is that this is a really really solid game that a family can get involved with it's got really really cool mechanics uh, in it in the fact that you're able to move uh, three different ships on your turn so you're playing cards and how you're going to do that you're going to be moving three uh, different uh, different uh, boats around so two of them you're using to kind of uh, accomplish your objectives and the other one is a neutral playing uh, ship that everybody's going to be moving around so uh, really kind of uh, changes uh, the way of uh, you know point to point movement game and so you're playing these cards and you're moving things around and so you can kind of really stick it to your uh, your opponent and try and stop them from doing things along the way and this has a tremendous amount of production value with really really cool uh, plastic pieces that are on there it has metal coins and it just looks really really big this one takes up a lot of space on the table so it's really something fun to look at so that's Black Fleet. So those are the top five uh, games that I uh, gave honorable mentions to for uh, 2014. Now let me get started with my actual top 10. Coming in at number 10 is the DC Comics deck building game Forever Evil. And this is the third installment of this particular uh, this particular series in deck building games from Cryptozoic. This uses the Cerberus engine. And um, this one here uh, kind of changes the, your uh, whole mindset about deck building. 
And uh, typically, you know, and I mentioned it with Valley of the Kings, that you're, you're adding cards into your deck to make your deck stronger. Well, this one changes things around. And playing as a villain in here, which is what you're going to be doing, um, one of the things that uh, really changes this whole gameplay is the ability to destroy cards. And so essentially what you're going to be doing is you're able to thin out your deck. And so one thing that um, is kind of typical in a deck building game is you still have starter cards in there. Well, this one here helps you to be able to eliminate those, getting rid of those cards. And so you're going to be able to get around to playing a really, really solid built engine a lot faster in here. Now, if you take the time and you start uh, destroying other cards, there were vi uh, victory points. Uh, that's kind of one of the things that uh, in this game you really have to weigh the options of. Is it worth it to uh, give up some victory points to destroy some cards to get other benefits? So it really, really adds to that. Also, you have the really, really cool theme of having the DC comic villains in here going against the heroes. And also this has in the rules uh, the variant uh, being able to combine this with the previous two sets that had to do with heroes. So this one here really solid, really changes uh, your mindset of playing a deck building game and that is the uh, DC Comics uh, deck building game Forever Evil. Coming in at number nine <clears throat> we have Zombie 15 Minute from Yellow and this is a cooperative game for two to four players and the, the neat thing with this one is it's a zombie game and there's been a lot of zombie games but this one plays in 15 minutes and it, it's in real time so you have a soundtrack that you're playing along with this game and every time the zombie growls you have to add you have to add zombies to this zombie pool of uh, this little box and uh, as you're playing you're moving along you're using your actions you're doing things um, you're trying to complete a specific objective do something get to the exit before time runs out and with the real time it just adds so much tension but there's some other cool things in here too as well when you gather up your weapons and you're using them they eventually are going to break if you're using a gun you can run out of ammo and and then uh, you have to reload it if you're using a thing like a bat or something like that um, eventually after you use it so many times it's going to break and you have to find something else so a couple things that really really um, uh, stand out in this game uh, opposed to some of the other zombie games that have come out and this is a lot of similar to like Zombicide but this one plays in 15 minutes and this is going to give you uh, the same if not more tension because of that real-time aspect and uh, again with the zombie games anytime you make noise uh, it's going to cause chaos and uh, trouble but this one here is really really fun it's very very simple to play so the whole family can get involved with this and again with a 15 minute playing time uh, definitely worth uh, being able to play this one so zombie 15 minute Number eight is Provincia Romana, and this one was put out by Passport Game Studios, done by Stradalibri, and I just recently did my review for this one, it just came out, and the reason why this game has made my top ten is that in terms of a civilization building game, which this is, and the civilization games are very, very popular, this one tends to be uh, very, very approachable, and this is a good one for families to be able to start and play. There is an uncomplicated set of rules as to how to play this game. Uh, it, the rule book is very well laid out, and uh, it's not a complicated process from phase to phase to phase. Now, in my review, I did mention that there is a couple of issues in here with learning the symbols on the cards, but that can be easily uh, overcome the longer that you play the game, or if you're playing in a smaller group, you could have the rule book open. But if you're playing this with five or six, be prepared when you're first starting to kind of have to, uh, to show people what the symbols are. But still, this is a solid, solid game. Uh, that is very, very approachable in terms of a civilization building game. And this is something that uh, if you're a family just getting into the hobby, this is a, a good game that you can use as, as a, a basis for starting your library with something that's beyond a gateway game. So Provincia Romana. Okay, my number seven pick is La Isla from Ravensburger. And this is from designer Stefan Feld. And he is a very popular 
uh, game designer who has a lot of popular games out that are in most uh, gamers' libraries. This one uh, came out just recently, and in my opinion, this is one of Stefan Feld's most approachable games uh, for multiple players. And uh, it has a mechanic of programming cards. You're going to be dealt these, these, uh, this hand of cards. You're going to look at them, and each one has three different um, things on there, and they do different things depending upon what slot you place them in, in your individual little player board. And so what you're going to do is you're going to place them. One of them is going to give you a new rule that you're going to be able to um, use each turn or the, like a little ability. Uh, you're also going to be gathering up resources and you're going to be placing your scientists on this island to, um, in a kind of an area control manner, to surround these exotic uh, animals that are on this island in order to research them, study them, and photograph them. So... Uh, and the game has a, a scaling option in there to make it a little bit less difficult in a, because there's two different types of cards. There's ones that have number one on there and there's some that have number two. If you play with just the number one cards, it makes the game um, simpler, but it takes away from some of the really cool benefits that are in the game. However, uh, you could play this with young players because I played this with my eight-year-old niece and my six-year-old nephew, and uh, they both caught on to the game very, very well. I had to give them a little bit of coaching early on, but uh, we played this game and they they did extremely well in playing this game. So I think that this is a solid game from a very popular designer. It's got a really cool artwork, a really uh, a, a approachable game to play that's going to teach you about um, air, you know, like a little bit about area control, getting in certain things, and managing and gathering up your resources and making decisions as to what's the best way to utilize your cards in your hand. So uh, this one, La Isla from Stefan Feld. <clears throat> Number six is Spike from R and R Games, and this one just came out uh, within the last month. This game was released, maybe uh, in maybe yeah, about maybe it was late November. This game came out, and um, this uh, this game here uh, has a lot going on with it. Um, it has you know it has a train game, but there's an economic aspect in here, and it also has some uh, you have route building and pick up and deliver options, and so you've got these multiple different things in here that really lend for an exciting experience. Uh, you're you're going to be dealt uh, certain types of cargo that it's your responsibility to go and uh, pick it up at a spot and going and delivering it to another city in order to uh, gather up um, money and the money is used as your victory points so uh, you're going to be having to do that you're going to be gathering up cards in your hand to build the tracks to uh, connect from city to city and once you connect routes depending upon uh, when you connect it whatever commodity that is uh, there's like a little commodity market chart that's going to you're going to earn money that way your train you'll be able to upgrade it uh, to be able to make it move faster, uh, you can make it uh, where you're able to gather up more cards so you have more um, cards in your hand that you can work with. And then also you can uh, add on additional cargo cards so you can pick up uh, multiple things on your train. So, um, so you've got those cool things. And then finally you have a destination card that you're going to be dealt and so you're going to want to have to try and connect different things. So. So you've got a lot of different things that you can manage in this game. It gives an overall really, really cool experience for this. Um, I highly recommend this one. If you, uh, um, if you are into, uh, into a, a, a train-type games, this one's going to give you a satisfying experience. And it's not a complicated game, so uh, families can be able to uh, get up and playing this. r, &R Games has... Um, done a tremendous job of putting out games that are, are easy to understand and they're fun to play. They have very well written rule books and so um, this one, Spike. Alright, now we're moving into my top five here and coming in at number five is Sheriff of Nottingham. Now this is, this is uh, perhaps my favorite uh, party game uh, to play and this has got a lot of things going on in it too um, there's there's a lot of there's a, some bluffing and there's a set collection aspects that go in this game 
But the really neat thing with this game is that it takes the bluffing mechanic and it it puts it over the top. And so essentially what's going to happen is that one person is going to be the sheriff and everybody else is your common villagers and you have a hand of cards and you have this sack and there's two different types of goods that you have. You have what are considered legal goods, goods that are allowed to be transported throughout the kingdom and then there's contraband, things that are not uh, the, the common person's not supposed to have. It's supposed to be in the possession of the king or corrupt folks like the sheriff here. And so what's going to happen is you're going to take some of your goods and you're going to place them in your sack and as you're traveling along you're going to be declaring to the sheriff what you are bringing in. However, you can be a little deceptive and you can lie and what you're trying to do is you're trying to deceive the sheriff in order to uh, get your goods in and that's how you're going to be able to score points. Now, what makes this game stand out is the fact that you can bribe the sheriff to not look at your to look in your sack. You can bribe him um, to uh, look into other players' sacks as well. So there's this whole lot of player versus player versus player um, conflict. You're, you're bluffing, you can just declare and say, I'm bringing in these things, and you can kind of have a smirk on your face to make it look like you're bringing in contraband. And if the sheriff's wrong, he has to pay you. So it's a tremendously fun, fun, fun party game uh, that uh, you can have a lot of fun with it. And the artwork on this is simply amazing. I think for 2014 uh, games, this has the best artwork of everything that I have seen that's been released this year. And so that is uh, Sheriff of Nottingham. Number four. <clears throat> Quartermaster General by Griggling Games. And some of you guys may or may not be familiar with this one, but what this is doing is uh, you are able to cover the whole entire World War II campaign, both the uh, Pacific and uh, Europe in one game that can be played in uh, a couple of hours. And what this is, is this is taking the, uh, the idea of a war game, kind of making it into a Euro style game, um, and, it's, and it's more casual and more approachable. And this one plays anywhere from two to six players. And the neat thing is with this, is that each country, there's six countries in here, each have their own deck. And, and it's a card-driven game, so you're just playing cards and placing pieces on the board. Um, and each card, or each deck, um, acts differently, and it's representative of that particular country and how it was in World War II. For example, um, Japan has a lot of cards that allow you to be uh, to be sneaky, and uh, so that's really uh, one of the things that makes this stand out um, in terms of, of games. It's a, a relatively easy game to play. There's a couple of concepts that um, that uh, take a little get, bit of getting used to, and that's um, when you're building your navy fleets. But the whole idea of this game and being quartermaster general is maintaining lines of supply from your uh, from established. Uh, areas like your home country or uh, any place on the board where there's a star those are like basically supply stations and what you're looking to do is to make sure that as your units expanding that they are maintained uh, in a line of supply where they're able to essentially get their food and ammunition and everything else like that so uh, this one quartermaster general uh, this is an awesome game I I had recommended this one to Marco Arnato, and he did a stunning review on this game too. And so I, this one here, uh, if, if ever there was a sleeper game for 2014, is Quartermaster General. Um, if you want to uh, experience uh, a lot of the World War II aspects, there's some historical notes in here, you want to be able to share that. Or um, if you're a World War II buff and you're looking to play something, this is a game that's more approachable and it doesn't take hours and hours to play. So, Quartermaster General. Alright, number three. Imperial Settlers from Portal Games, designed by Ignacy Trevicek. And the neat thing about this game is he took the concepts from 51st State 
which is a, a little bit of an older game, modernized it, streamlined it, and brought out Imperial Settlers. And the neat thing about this game is that each per, um, player is playing a specific civilization, and as you're essentially building your engine of cards and doing different things, each of the cards have three different things that you can do with them. So um, you can, uh, what you can do is you can build it. Um, so you're going to add on there, you can raise it, basically you can essentially conquer it for one time thing, or you can negotiate and where you're going to be able to get ongoing resources. And so it takes the whole idea of card, the, the mechanic from 51st state, brings it into this. Uh, this is a tremendous, tremendous game. Uh, you can play this one solitaire. Um, you can play this with... Uh, up to four players each one's playing a different race and the neat thing is with this here now is that uh, he came out with an expansion uh, will be available here in, uh, in the United States readily in 2015 called why can't we be friends and what that does now is adds the element of open production uh, from 51st state as in here in a few different things and uh, really is setting the basis for this game to almost be like a living card game. And so this is really kind of revolutionizing a few different things here of taking a, a regular standalone game and then easily being able to convert this into something that's going to be living and being able to have these little mini expansions. Uh, and so this one, high hopes for this game going into 2015, hoping that uh, they'll be developing maybe some new races to be coming out with this game. Uh, but this one, tremendous, tremendous game, uh, really a good, um, a good mind bender of being able to make the greatest use of what you can do with your cards since they have three different options. You have every single card you have in your hand, you can do three different things. Then what your decision makes uh, happens with one is going to affect what's going to happen on your other cards as well. So Imperial Settlers from Portal Games, great, great game. Number two. Legendary Encounters from Upper Deck. And so again, now we have, this is the third deck building game that has been in my list of top games. And uh, that's just because there's been a lot of them that came out this year. And there's a lot of them. Actually, this is the fourth one, I'm sorry, the fourth deck building game here. Um, because we have, I had Valley of the Kings and Shadowrun Crossfire in my honorable mentions. This one here... This, the best thing about this is it takes the legendary engine and it basically, um, in my opinion, really kicked it into high gear. So you have the typical, uh, the typical aspect of the little symbols on the cards and having these card, uh, this card synergy that's going on. But really in this game, what it does is it takes a game and makes it fully cooperative. Now, uh, and you're not, there's really no way to harm one another. And so when you're playing some of the other deck building games and you're supposed to be working together to defeat villains, there's always a competitive uh, nature to it. Even in the earlier on, the, the other um, Marvel Legendary and Marvel Legendary villains, there's still this aspect of you can kind of stick it to your opponents. Legendary Encounters makes us a fully cooperative uh, deck building game and in fact there's no victory points for them and then the biggest thing with this is that it has this feature called coordinate and you're able to play cards um, from your hand to help out other players when it's not your turn so um, you have if you have certain cards you can play them and, uh, and then you'll be essentially be able to draw another one. But what you can do is that you can use your cards and using your abilities to kind of be as a team, buff up one of the, the players, whoever the main player is, and help them to be able to defeat the aliens. So uh, that, to me, huge, huge, huge thing with this. Number two, one simple rule change on here of taking the uh, basically the bad cards that are coming out from the hive and they're coming out face down. You have no idea what's coming. And it really captures the whole suspense uh, from the Alien movies of really not knowing what's going on. Um, so you have these cards that are coming out face down instead of face up. Changes everything. Adds to a uh, really, really uh, cool element to this game. Alright, my number one game for 2014 is 
HP Lovecraft's Kingsport Festival. And this game here, uh, the first time that I played this one, I knew this was uh, my game uh, of the year. This is my number one favorite game right now of all time uh, behind Alien Frontiers and Kingsburg. Um, and one of the reasons why is personally I like the dice worker placement games. I like the fact that I can, I'm rolling them, I have to work with what I have, and then being able to task them. Uh, I just really, really like that mechanic. And in in uh, Kingsport Festival, you've got a couple different things that really uh, that I like. Number one, uh, this is the theme of this is obviously Lovecraftian, so the whole Cthulhu mythos. And what they did with this game is that it made it made the whole Lovecraftian thing approachable because um, a lot of people will play the games because they like his writings, but H.P. Lovecraft's writings are difficult to get through. Uh, you need a dictionary to understand some of the words that he uses. And there's long stories, and there's a lot of them. Now, with this one here, you don't have to be a 100% familiar with all of his stuff to enjoy this game because in the rule book and on the backs of the um, the Elder God cards there's essentially like little biographies that you're going to be able to uh, get an insight into the game and you're going to be able to learn the Lovecraftian lore as you're playing the game. Secondly you have this you have the solid mechanic of the dice worker placement game and then you also have these added elements in there now of managing your sanity and also you have uh, a magic level for casting spells. And the sanity thing is really cool because uh, because uh, it adds a little bit of this risk taking in there and um, if you start running your sanity low uh, it could hurt you really bad. But the other thing is that if you're, running, if you're risking that some, uh, some abilities are going to give you additional bonuses if you're running more towards the insane side. And uh, the other thing that uh, that this game really stands out for me is that you have these different uh, scenarios that come about and so when the investigators come to attack uh, it's not a specific uh, set interval like in Kingsburg so sometimes things could be closer or further apart uh, so I like that the different scenarios sometimes there'll be a festival at the end so it adds a d uh, the diversity of gameplay and then the other thing is that now instead of like in Kingsburg where there was only like one monster that was going to attack, now there's an event and an investigator. So you have two different things now that uh, you have to deal with, and so it just adds to the uh, to the to the uh, overall experience of the game. It adds some complexity to the game without um, without weighing it down. I think that to me it kind of streamlines a few of the things in. Uh, from Kingsburg and overall this one is my top game for 2014 so overall just a, a really I think I have a pretty good um, pretty good selection of of different games that to me uh, are were the top games that were released in 2014 and I would stand by any of these and say that there are really awesome benefits by playing these games you're going to uh, just by playing them it's going to uh, develop certain skills in your life that you're going to be carrying on uh, with you there are games that uh, as a family unit you can play them and enjoy them together and um, and be able to uh, have a really really good time uh, as a family uh, if you are a couple it's something that you can uh, share with other friends these are things that also if you're just if you're out doing things you can bring these to a game night or use them to host a game night at your own home and so just a really really great um, variety of games here that uh, I feel um, meet the criteria that I had to set forth for my list of games for 2014 so, all right, I look forward to lots of good games for 2015, and uh, we're going to be continuing rolling on with some uh, really uh, good reviews coming out from uh, games. I'm still working on ones that are from 2014, but we're going to be uh, rolling into the new year. I've got some new things planned, uh, some so lots of different uh, ideas that I'm going to be trying out along the way. But I wanted to share my list of top games with you for 2014.
All right, and uh, thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to uh, my channel below. You can hit the subscribe button. And uh, if you're interested in following me on Twitter, you can uh, do that. My Twitter handle is the number two, The Table Review. And uh, you can keep up to date with a lot of uh, additional information and little insights and snippets that I will be posting along the way. All right. Uh, so thank you for watching, and I look forward to talking to you again about board games and seeing how they make them to the table. Bye-bye.